So you might say, what are we doing in a disused herring factory on the north coast of Iceland? But actually, just outside this laboratory, just a few hundred uh, metres out to sea, is a bubbling hydrothermal vent. A really remarkable environment uh, where you've got this superheated seawater and all these animals clustered around it. Uh, and we're here to find out more about what on earth is going on there. So we're a team from the Naturalistry Museum in London, from uh, the University of Leeds and from the University of Southampton. And we're here in this amazing place, Eyjafjörður, a fjord on the north coast of Iceland, to document these remarkable underwater habitats, these hydrothermal vents on the seafloor. Hydrothermal vents really one of the most amazing discoveries of the 20th century. When they were found, people found these amazing novel life forms there, these giant tube worms in the deep sea. And for a long time, people thought they were very unusual and extreme ecosystems. But actually now we know that they're prevalent right through the world's oceans. And perhaps uh, they are places where life evolved originally. Microbial life many billions of years ago could well have originated at hydrothermal vents. One of the things that excites us about vents is really not just not about this idea that it's the origin of life, but actually that they've driven the evolution of animal life in our more recent oceans, in our more recent past. Uh, and we potentially could see that here, uh, in this fantastic example here in the field in Iceland. Oh, do we want to tape up? Just tape up the loom. Oh, we've done it. Oh, we're good. Yeah, actually, I want to just put a bit of tape Extra bits yeah. that all together are always good. <laughs> There's pretty much nothing in social science, or maps any science isn't held together with a bit of tape. Bit of tape. Bit of tape and a uh, cable tie. <laughs> we could do a cable tie if you want. No, no. Yeah, good to go. Rob is in the water and we're just having a little hunt for the vents with the sonar on the rod. Shouldn't be too hard to find, it's quite a big chimney sticking up so the sonar should see it when we're at the right depth and pointing in broadly the right direction. What's that, uh, depth uh, 17 metres, 1.7. We have our mini ROV Rex in the water at the moment and we're looking for the hydrothermal vent chimney which should be around 20 metres depth east of where we are right now. Okay, I'm at 20 metres, two zero metres. So this is the uh, vent site which I'm going to be diving on to collect animals from. But this is our first Rex dive and we're going to use that as a guide for when I dive on the site a little bit later. So hopefully we'll see interesting animals that I can go and collect at a later date. I'm very excited. This is going to be the first time I get to see a vent that close Like, there it is, I can see it. Did you find it? Yeah, we're just coming up on the vent, uh, it's pretty exciting. So I'm just going to come up here and have a look at the uh, marine life here. We've just gone straight into the vent chimney wall at about 25 metres. We're going to come up now to the top, have a look at that fluid uh, that's coming out of the top, surveying the animals that we're going to pick up later with the scuba operation. So it's great. So piloting an ROV is obviously very different to scuba diving, but it's actually is like very immersive. Like you feel you're there. Oh, you can see the shimmery water beautifully there. Look oh, at that. I can feel it warm yeah. in the belly. Yeah. Rex, the ROV is fantastic because it can spend long periods underwater. Doesn't get cold, doesn't complain. Uh, it can go really, really deep, uh, but we need a human. We need a human to get down there and collect those samples by hand uh, and actually bring them back up to the surface. Uh, but Chris uh, can go down and fill his bag up with specimens that we can then study here in the lab. This is a perfect day. The sea is uh, completely flat. We have the sun and uh, the blue sky. The only thing we have to be back for dark that will be in August. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So the idea is that we're going to be collecting animals which are living close to the vent sites, but also the same animal species away from the vents as well. And the idea then is to compare them genetically to see if we can see any differences in the genes of the animals which are living close to the vent sites and then of the animals which are living further away from the vent sites. And the idea is to see if there's some adaptation of those animals to living close to those hydrothermal vent sites, which is a very challenging sort of environment. And we think that animals may need to show genetic adaptations that perhaps are not something that we can see looking at the animals directly, but is something expressed in their genetics. heading back to the lab to take uh, photos of the specimens that Chris just collected and we're also going to take some tissue samples. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. Fantastic. Is it a big mussel? What is it? Yeah, I think it's my ears. Ah! Whoa. Fantastic. And those are associated for now. So we can pick away at that, mm -hmm. collect all kinds of things. Okay. So we have a little look at it. Whoa! Wow. So now that we've got samples back from the diving, one of the first things that we're going to do is take a really good photograph of each specimen to document exactly what it looked like when it was alive. And then after that we'll take a small sub-sample from the specimen and preserve it inside a special solution which uh, makes sure its DNA doesn't degrade. And then we'll do further DNA analyses when we're back in London. We just have to make sure we document everything, that we take nice photos of the specimens that you can see them the way they look when they were alive because as soon as we put them in ethanol they're gonna go white. We brought a microscope all the way from the Natural History Museum in order to be able to look for the tiny animals that might be living around the bigger animals that we collect during the dives. When people first discovered hydrothermal vents, there was a sort of general perception of them being extreme ecosystems, these sort of high temperature, uh, rich in chemical environments where life might struggle to exist. But we have a sort of working joke hypothesis, really, that actually the opposite is true. Everyone likes a hot bath, uh, so why not the animals of the, in the deep sea? At this time of year, the sun just doesn't go down in Iceland which makes it fantastic for doing science. But I have no idea what the time is now. It could be midnight, it could be midday. Uh, we've been working really hard and really long hours collecting samples. Uh, so it's, it's actually a huge advantage. It's really wonderful. When we get the samples back to the lab, we're gonna analyze their DNA. And we'd be so excited if we can see that the animals living on the hydrothermal vents are actually different genetically and different physiologically to the animals, the same species living on the rocky walls around there. Uh, so it would be an amazing thing if we can find that, then we can really show this is an example of speciation and adaptation to a vent environment right now, uh, here uh, in Eyjafjord on the north coast of Iceland. Mm -hmm.